Welcome to the Sales Podcast, Session 77. It's time to write something down. Welcome to the 77th edition of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today we've got Mr. Bond Halbert. Uh, Bond is a copywriting guru. And when I say copywriting, we don't mean attorneys, all right? When people refer to themselves as a copywriter, it means we write content, we write sales copy, which helps people sell things. Uh, Bond is the son of the late, great Gary Halbert, uh, who has many uh, reasons to be called an expert, but one of which uh, is the fact that he wrote the most delivered sales letter in history. Uh, Over 600 million copies of a letter that he wrote uh, were sent, and Bond grew up literally at the foot, sitting on the knees of Gary Halbert, and um, that helped him become an expert in his own right. Um, Bond has helped sell over $23 million worth of info products, uh, all by the written word. So you are in for a treat with what I was able to pull out of Bond in this uh, over an hour long interview. So since we're talking about writing, I couldn't find a good joke about journalists necessarily, but I found one about a photographer working for a newspaper, right? And there was a big forest fire and the smoke was obviously everywhere and it was too thick for him to get any uh, good photos. So he called the office and said, I need a plane uh, to help me get over the smoke to get the photos we need. And they said, fine, go to the little airport around the corner and a plane will be waiting for you. So he hauls Bud over there, and sure enough, there's a plane um, already fired up, ready to go. He hops in the back. He says, fly over the north side of the fire. Make three or four low-level passes. Why, asked the pilot. Because I'm going to take pictures. I'm a photographer, and photographers take pictures, said the photographer with great exasperation. Oh, boy, said the pilot. You mean you're not the instructor? Look at that. Another clean one you can use over and over again. How you like them apples? So let's get in to Bond's interview after we do the sales podcast creed, which is today is my day. I work diligently towards my goals, which are bigger than me. I bite off more than I can chew because only then will I truly know my current limits and surpassing them becomes my new goal for today. Through education, accountability partners, and bold, decisive action, today will be better than yesterday and tomorrow will be better yet. I'm ready to produce. And now let's produce a great interview with copywriting guru, Bond Halbert. Bond Halbert, fellow SoCal resident, copywriter, marketing guru extraordinaire. How the heck are you, man? Welcome to the show. I'm good, and thank you. And I, I wouldn't even con- be consider myself a baby guru. but <laughs> All right, baby guru, whatever you want, I'll take it, man. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but for our listeners that, that may not know who you are, would you mind take a, a minute or two and, and give us a, a quick lowdown on who you are and what you do, and, and we'll get into the meat? Sure. Uh, well, you know, like you said, my name is Bond Halbert, and you might recognize the last name because my father was one of the best copywriters who had ever lived, uh, Gary Halbert. And I had a very unique education in growing up in the business. In fact, I recently published a book that my uh, dad had put together out of a series of letters he had written me. And then he had asked if he could, much later on, if he could have permission to publish these. And the great thing about those letters is they're not only filled with great content. This is the born letters, by the way. They kind of proved that I had this education that most people were getting in marketing, like in their late 20s and later, that I was getting it at like 15 and earlier. (laughs) Right. So I really grew up in the business. So I don't have the, you know, sleeping in my car, rags to riches story that a lot of people have. What I have is more like, you know, born lucky kind of a story. So, you know, uh, but from that point, I did on my own, completely separate and, you know, have nothing to do with my father, went on to sell millions of dollars in info products and, you know, do my own thing. And then when he had passed away, we became the shepherds of his, you know, his kind of his legacy. And then the one thing I found myself increasingly doing is people figured out that I was I didn't just have the Halbert name. I had the Halbert acumen. (laughs) So I started teaching a little bit more and showing people and then updating my dad's stuff so that people could understand how the 
how the formula for which he does to get his his snail mail, what we call now, or back then you call junk mail, opened, and how that can translate into getting your emails opened, and how these principles and everything have never changed, and how you see them in use all the time in direct marketing. And so, but then you know, and I've created, a, you know, started doing a lot of stuff on my own content because. You know, I've, t- I've taken much more of the Halbert thinking into the digital sort of age. So, for example, you know, I'm really no- known for getting extraordinarily high open rates. Like I can get a I've gotten this like 50 percent open rates on lists with, you know, tens of thousands of names on them. So, you know, the, and that's, you know, a lot of people don't know about how the rates go. And when you have an unclean scrubbed list like that, they get really big. And so people started. Just like whatever they noticed about me is what, you know, I started getting more well-known for and asked about. But I basically kind of like, you know, deliver what people are looking for. (laughs) Right. So, um, but now, you know, I mean, so there's now there's starting to be, you'll start to see more stuff that's just, it's not only my stuff. It's not my dad's augmented, but it, you'll actually start to see that, you know, um, we, my brother and I, too, I don't want to leave him out of this. We take we took our father's sort of train of thought and we're the ones who very we can very successfully apply it and adapt it much easier because it's ingrained in us from childhood. You know, right. you think about it. My dad started learning about marketing when he was 30. Right. He lost you know, he he lost the last job he ever had the day before I was born. Right. I started learning when I was about 11. And even before, and I mean learning, learning. Before 11, I was just doing what other kids in family businesses do, sweep the floor and stuff envelopes and <laughs> stamp and seal and things like that. Um, but, you know, and so the... So we so because it's in you know it's so ingrained that those basic fundamentals it's a lot easier for us to go ahead and translate these lessons and or put that knowledge to use in digital world as well. But of course you know direct marketing is really or direct mail is also very hot right now um, amongst the players because there's little competition and you you know you got such a grab on people's attention when they're opening mail and not at their computer. So you know the, uh, so we also get you know clients and people who request, uh, you know, you know, information, not just how to do it, but they'll sometimes want to hire us to do it and things like that. Right. Uh, are you working solely with bigger companies or do you take on smaller mom and pop type clients? Actually, to tell you the truth, I don't like to take clients at all. I'll be honest with you. My brother took a couple, <laughs> and I ended, up, <laughs> I ended up doing some stuff with them. But and and I'm happy to because I really, you know, I enjoy it, and it's a change of pace. <clears throat> but uh, you know, early on, if you follow my dad's teachings, and what you'll find out is that the best way to take his information is to actually use it and apply a lot of it for your own business. Because I, I'll give you an example. I put together and outlined and put together all the core principles for a marketing campaign that's sold about $21 million worth of um, info products. And what happened was, and I got a piece of it for doing that, okay? So we get a piece of that, but the thing is that piece wasn't nearly as much money as I would make if I just create my own product that sells, you know, know, only a million or two dollars worth. So it's more lucrative. Plus, of course, you know, I, I grew up Spending, I literally just spending. Nobody spent more time listening to people say, "Hey, Gary, how would you market this?" than me, and I'm always sitting there going, "Okay, this is what he's going to say," and so forth. And I got really good. I mean, I became like the best in the world at figuring out this is what Gary was going to tell you. <laughs> um, and so the thing is, but I saw how the client relationship and how the evolution of a copywriter went. And so my goal is, I, you know, I'm never going to be one of the best copywriters in the world. I don't want to write for 14 different companies and different people and stuff like that. I, I like to write for myself and my own things. And so, yeah, I've taken on some clients here and there, but I don't, you know, I don't even want to put, open that door and get people to start ringing the bell. <laughs> right. And but and it's and it's just simply because the sanity involved with you know, you know it's bad enough when you're doing your own copy and your own thing you want it to work and everything but when you have somebody else who's paid you money and they're you know telling you that this is like do or die for them in their business and the pressures on right. you know I'm a very empathetic person I, I you know I mean if if you ask me to help you I'm going to you know do my very very best and so you know I, I can't just turn around and. You know, ignore, and so I feel the pressure, and I don't like that pressure. Right. <laughs> and, I, and I don't, and then of course, there's also, you know, the whole, you know, some clients want to call you in the middle of the night at home all the time. <laughs> right. Like well, it's funny, I, I'm evolving into that as well. I mean, I, 
I almost went out of business when I first started the Sales Whisperer because I I was losing more sleep over my clients' lack of success than they were. Yeah. You know, it's like, I care more about your business than you do. It's like, dude, come on. You know, and it's just I had to stop working with a lot of them and, and change my model because, yeah, I, I market myself much better than anybody else, no matter how much they pay me. Yeah, and, you know, like I said, there's an evolution of a copywriter, which is, you know, at first they – first. <clears throat> you know, there's two, they come from two forms. They come from people who, you know, kind of have picked up on like they saw some great winning ad or they saw some copywriter who's making good money and they kind of came in that way. But the majority are people like, you know, wanted to start a business, wanted to do their own thing, and then they quickly realize, hey, the one thing nobody's got the talent for that's the most important is the marketing. And of that marketing, the hardest part is the copy, right? <laughs> And if they're small business, this has to work. And so they start, you know, getting more interested in it that way. And then what will happen is they start studying. They say, well, who are the giants and who are the guys who know what they're talking about? Where can I learn this? And they learn about the Gary Halbert letter. And they go there and get addicted and lock themselves in a room for a week. You know, and they grab books from anywhere that they can get them. And they, you know, and it, it's funny because I, you know, I, whenever I think of a younger copywriter, I always imagine an apartment that's almost empty with almost nothing on the walls except for ads. You know, and stacks of books on the floors and, right. and marketing courses because, you know, I mean, just such a high percentage of them. And usually like a guitar or a mountain bike in the corner. Right. <laughs> but anyway, eventually they get to going to where like you are, which is, you know, after they first then they struggle to get their first clients, you know, and then they struggle to get traction. And then when they hit a big winner, that one client wants to monopolize their time. And so they're like, great, I'm going to get all this work and everything's working out. And then it, that goes to a certain point where one of those, you know, one of those ads doesn't work and, you know, the copywriter's not being treated like the angel anymore. And so that relationship gets a little weird or soured. And now he's looking for other work, but he hasn't, you know, been out on the market because he's been, you know, his time was monopolized by this client he was delivering w winners for, right? <laughs> and then yep. they and then they say, okay, well, let me take on clients. And they take on more clients, not just one or two. You know, they have a little safety in numbers, variety. Then they deal with the nightmare of what we're talking about, which is, you know, being worried about the, you know, you're now sort of worried about your own life. You're worried about four businesses. <laughs> right. You know, and there's only so much time in the day and, you know, so forth. And the, so, and the thing is, a lot of people don't know, it's not just sitting down and writing. You know, they don't understand the whole, it's the thought process that you're, is what you is where the talent is. It's in the research, it's in the research, the follow through, the professionalism is in the editing and stuff like that. The actual time you spend just, dumping the words on the of the first draft onto the paper or the computer screen is the least amount of time. All right. So what do you what do you do for your own marketing then? What what can our listeners take away uh, in so far as uh, you know the the old reliables, right? How do I come up with a good headline? Uh, you know, when do I ask for the order? How often do I link to it? You know, should I should I have them go to an order form online or should they have a phone number where they call or shoot <clears throat> both, you know, I mean. Okay, I'll tell you what, shoot me one of those at a time. I know the answers to all of them, all right. <laughs> but you have to shoot me one at a time. <laughs> well, every, everybody knows or they should know that the headline is the most important uh, sure. piece of your marketing material, whether it's online, an email, or direct mail. Or, um, so how, how can, you know, let, let's picture a, a local chiropractor or local insurance agency uh, a local auto glass dealer, right, that is listening to this and they, they want to take control of their own marketing and are like, all right, help me, Bond, get better at writing headlines. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, it's funny that you're asking them this one, and I don't, it's, one of the, it's one of the things that I actually put together as a piece of content. So I'll give you some key tips on it, but <laughs> I don't want to give you the full 30-minute lesson. <laughs> sure. And we'll, okay. uh, you know, at the end, you know, give me all the links, and we'll link to it in the show Absolutely. Notes. Absolutely. First of all, I'll tell you, there's a couple of versions out there, but one of the ones just for straight headline writing. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you now something that will actually augment that content and make it better. Okay. So um, 
actually, I'm going to point you to um, uh, my buddy Lawton actually one time recorded me showing him a lesson. So I showed him. He, I go, hey, you want to see a quick trick to making headlines? And he goes, oh, that's awesome because I shared it on Skype through the, you know, the screen sharing. Yep. And he recorded it. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and, and I knew that he was going to record it and stuff, but then, you know, he wanted to turn it into a product. And I said, sure. And so it was, so it, it teaches a main, like, great trick for grabbing a hook. And what it does is teach you the basics, which I'm going to show you now, but it walks you through it. So you sh- and by the way, you should go ahead and grab it because, you know, immediately after we, we put that out, there were marketers calling me and they had this one great story. This guy calls me and says, you know, I got your thing, and I thought this is really cool. So I put I put it into action, and I'm, I got a list with thirty thousand names on it, and it tripled my open rate. And I was like, "Wow, that's really good." But then he saw somebody else send him an email, and he's like, "Man, your subject line was so good." <laughs> he goes, how'd, "How'd you, you know, how'd you do it?" He goes, "Well, I got this video with this guy Bond, <laughs> you know, and so forth." So the thing is, if it works to even one percent you know increase oh which is this it's going to do much better than that you know for the rest of all the stuff emails you're sending out it's worth like the 17 bucks or something that lot and charges for this but anyway here's the key concept in there and you'll be able to use this one is what really gets a headline and grips people is first of all i want to encourage everybody to go to the dark side i know that everybody wants to talk about positivity rainbows and light but here's the thing i if i told you if I, I mean, and you're into marketing, and you know me, and so if I said, here's seven great ways to write a headline, you're going to be interested in maybe click on that post. But if I say the seven horrible things that just happened to me in prison, you have no choice but to click on that, <laughs> right? Okay, because the, the, the dark side, our, our, our thirst for gossip, our thirst for that kind of stuff, that curiosity that goes in there is really powerful, which is the second key, which is you have to use a lot of curiosity. Now, I... When I email people, because you have an email sequence campaign, uh, usually if you're going to get the most results for selling something, you can't just drop one email. You drop an email, a couple of reminders, and then, hey, you better get this while time's running out type of sense of urgency email. So what I do is I put the first email has got a real heavy sense of curiosity. And the second one will have less curiosity and more benefit because it's kind of a reminder to people who read the first one that didn't move, but it's also going to attract people who are more attracted to benefits than curiosity. But what I'll do for a headline for an ad or, you know, the headline at the top of, let's say, a uh, newsletter, or, excuse, not, excuse me, direct mail piece, is you use the curiosity and some benefit because the best combination is the two of them. But you do it sort of like the dark side. So, you know, it's more like, you know, this is finally revealed as, it, as it, you know, you have to add that to, uh, you know, me showing you this XYZ benefit. And so uh, I'll give you examples like of pure curiosity. I did, you know, the book that my dad wrote to me, these letters he wrote to me, he actually wrote to me, it's a very long story, but from from a place called Boron, which was a federal prison camp, right? So I had written one uh, post one time and I wanted to draw attention to it. So I made it things I, uh, you know, thank God my dad went to prison, right? So that's just pure curiosity, Right. The second, when you add benefits to stuff and you're like, you know, 13 email lessons from prison, now I've got benefit and curiosity. Okay. So you want to add benefit and curiosity. Now, here, now what you want to model after are sources of news. News is always in the job of presenting to us a story that shakes us and makes us pay attention. And you know how they always say, you know, truth is stranger than fiction? Sure. Well, it's always a news story they're they're referring to when they, right before they say that, right? right. <laughs> so you want to go to the news stories and model after that. And what this does, that video that I was telling you about, the content does, is it takes you to the three very best sources to go and model those news those news things after. And and the reason I can't even tell you about them now is if I tell you, you'll go to the wrong section. It has to be shown. You have to visually see where these are because these guys write these things that are so good. And, you know, we stumbled upon them because all of a sudden it was distracting me all day type of thing. And so um, – and it really is that way. I'm not trying to just make you go do it because I'm giving you all the meat of you know how to write a good headline. So, But you want to follow these salacious news stories, you know, and they're written the same way that people write this, the headlines for like CNN and Fox and stuff like that where they're trying to get intention. And you'll notice these guys also go to the dark side and leave a lot of curiosity out. 
But the, you know, and don't just go to regular news where what they do is they give away the whole story in the headline. Because as we were growing up, news was getting about the who, what, where, how, when, why, and all that as fast as possible to the reader. That's not the game with, with marketing. Okay, the game is to attract attention and suck them into the beginning. So don't just follow any news story. But if you follow these and you go look at that resource, it'll show you exactly how to get a whole hook for your campaign and a headline. But the best part about it is after you do the trick a few times, you now all of a sudden are just writing them great on your own because you really get the feel for it. You start to understand the difference between what works and what doesn't. And finally, I'm going to say Add numbers. Numbers add a, 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 a promise of specificity in whatever you're about to deliver. So let's say you're, you know, the, you know, you're going to say my hot email tips. That's not as attractive as my hot email tips for 2015. Right. Okay. And, and it's any number. I don't care if it's weight. You know, I don't care if it's time. I don't care if it's a day. If it's a percentage. If it's a dollar amount or anything. <laughs> Whenever you put the numbers in there, it adds a specificity that I'm expecting to see these things when I open it in that promise. And when you do that, it, it, incre- it increases open rates and it, in- it increases readership because, and, you know, you hear me. I do. Uh, you know, obviously, I end up writing more subject lines than headlines, but they are exactly the same thing. Sure. The first subject line is later on and subsequent ones are subsequent messages so that it, that I do treat differently but when it comes to headlines these are these are the ways that you can just you know at, you know after you watch that thing that I was telling you about the 7 minute subject lines you will literally just instantly be able to start writing subject lines and headlines and and those can be the main hook that you transition to in your in your copy Right. And, you know, and those and, and I use that every once in a while for myself, but it's only like, oh, my God, I got this email or I've got this thing promotion that I've got to get done. And I'm on <laughs> I'm on a deadline. It's usually an email, not a promotion, but um, or excuse me, an email promotion. I've got the, I've got to get this out. And, you know, I need a hook real quick and I'll right. go pop over there and I'll have a hook within, you know, like literally 120 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so but but anyway. Go to the dark side if you can. And it doesn't mean you have to be evil and mean to people and start, you know, all that other stuff. But it's just the the way that you pose things. You know, you could say the things I wish I knew now. I wish I knew this before this. Or you could say, you know, or you could say this, um, this such and such exposed. Right. It's just it's it's how you position it. You can always say something in the positive or the negative way. And in marketing, what you want to do for your attention is say it in the negative way. And then when you go into your copy, you almost say everything into the positive. So you don't say, we, you know, I'm putting these this survey so that you can ch- check off and I won't send you the things you don't want. What you do is you say, click, you know, I've inserted the survey so you can check on and I'll serve you only the things you do want. I'm saying the same thing, but that's in a positive, you know, it's, it's in a positive framework. Right. Go, go negative on the attention grabbing. And then in the copy at one quick point, you will, you know, depending, there are some industries, there are some industries where it's good to be negative all the way through. Right. You know, like in finance, you know, I mean, you want to, you know, the secrets hidden behind the evil empire men that are controlling everybody's money in wall street and why you can't make money in trading, but here's how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, but uh, so there, there is that, you know, and I, that's the other thing. I don't believe in absolutes in marketing. The only absolute I believe is that there's no absolutes, you know? (laughs) And I even go against my dad because in some cases I'm like, in some cases a jingle is a good idea. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, I have found that most people, I don't know if they lose their curiosity about their business or they just have done it for so long they they forget how nuanced and unique it is and so they they stop looking at the details and and they think oh there's nothing interesting in my business but you know you spend any amount of time with I don't care who an auto glass manufacturer you know I can ask them about thickness and Mm-hmm. Uh, how does it shatter, you know, away from the car or whatever? What's the materials? Is it recyclable? Is there anti-glare film? And, you know, I mean, there's all these interesting things you can write about. Just ask. But they, they do you the, see that? Like they're just too close to their business and, and they, they don't think there's anything unique to it, write about? It is universal. And if it wasn't, we'd be out of a job. Um, the, you know, the, the best copywriters in the world all issue to their clients surveys, 
in the surveys is like, okay, so here's um, here's what it'll say. It'll say here, who, what I do is I say who, what, where, when, how, and why on every question. But then I list the questions of things like, you know, where was this made? So that means where was it made? Why was it made there? How was it made there? <laughs> you know, so I mean, I want to know. So this is how you find out. You know, this was a s- small cottage in France or in Switzerland in the in the Ruhr Valley or whatever it is, and you find out it's made by native craftsmen. And there's, you know, and that's when you find out that there's five thousand hours hand hand man hours put into this handmade watch and all this stuff that tells a much more fascinating story than the the client tells you. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing, and it and it's just. It, it is. It has never failed. I mean, we have clients that you know. It's like you'll you'll worked with them for a few weeks, and you're like, you know, wait a minute, you didn't tell me you're like on the Forbes 100 list or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that 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 that's a good nugget of information to know. <laughs> yeah, you, you own 31 patents. What? what? Wait a but minute. You, but I, in all fairness, though, it is 100 percent universal. Uh, because I always forget the things even I've done. Right. Because one of the things I do is I experiment, play around, and move on. You know, I'll go pub- publish a Kindle book and, you know, I get it up to number one, play with some new ideas that are all mine and keep it up there for a while. And then I get bored and I'll just go on to something else. And it's what will keep me from being the giant that my dad is. Mm-hmm. You know, my dad is like, you know, it was copywriting ad copywriting ad copywriting ad copywriting ad copywriting ad for me it's like you know i started getting really high open rates just because my brother turned around and said oh you know it's not that easy to format these emails so i decided to learn it on my own so i started playing with this all on my own on a own little separate little private blog that i set up just so i could learn html right and pretty soon I did that with my daughter, also to teach her. And pretty soon, she's got a site that's got like 136,000 unique visitors a year. And I'm training her. I mean, she even gets 40% open rates <laughs> on her list with like 3,000 names or something. But the, but the point is, I'm an experimenter. And I like to, what I like to do is kind of like think a little bit differently than everybody else is. And sometimes, you know, you just come to the same genius conclusion somebody else did. Like... You know, when I put the Amazon, I, one of the things I want to do with the Boron letters was put it on Amazon and, you know, keep adding a little promotional to it to keep it up in the number one spot for as long as possible, right? Right. So I told everybody online, I'm going to throw a special, uh, you know, when it slipped. Uh, so actually, I did that and I had a whole procedure and I let it go and I kept it at number one for a long time, but then eventually, you know, you just let the book sit and do its own thing. And then months later, I was like, I just want to juice it again for fun. So I went online and I said, everybody who shares a a photo of themselves on Facebook, Google, Twitter, whatever, I will invite to this free webinar on Amazon book publishing. And and I'll teach you all the things I learned uh, on publishing a number one bestseller, a paid bestseller at full, you know, the full nine dollar price on Amazon. And everybody started doing this. And now the reason this works, and this is the kind of level of thinking that you'll see. Uh, that that a, a business owner is just too busy to think about. What happens is, you know, nobody who's into copywriting has one copywriting book or course on their shelf. They always got multiple. And if you know, so you, you also have if you you know you got a few hundred friends on your Facebook, a couple of them are into copywriting, right? Yeah. So if you're showing a book on copywriting and that guy sees a couple friends and they're showing a book on copywriting and they're all smiling and holding up a copy of the Boron Letters, it makes other people want a copy of the Boron Letters. So that actually gave me free advertising and free sales that turned out and shot the book back up to number one. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and so what I did was in the, in the web, but I did all kinds of stuff for this launch. I don't, you know, we don't have time to, and to make it all about this. So I, but the thing is in that webinar, the point that I was making is I delivered a whole bunch of just pure content on here's how to do this. And here's what I did. And here's, this is how you do this. And, and it was a lot of stuff on making extra money and making the most out of it that other, not just Kindle publishers, but people who teach people to publish Kindles are like, man, that's some genius stuff you're figuring out how to do. And then I just moved on. I mean, I never even posted that webinar anywhere, I don't think. <laughs> you oh. know, I, just, I just let them do it. And then I just move on to another project. And that, you know, that's, that's kind of my mentality because that's the way I like to live my life. My dad, you know, when he raised me, I got, you know, 
it, I'm not as motivated by money the way that other people are. I'm more motivated by, you know, how I spend my time and, you know, my, my, my ego and everything is wrapped up in solving problems more than anything else. It's, you know, and think and figuring things like that out. Right. Um, well, what was it like, um, you know, you, you say, you know, you, you were lucky, you know, how you were born. Is it lucky being born lucky? Well, <laughs> you know, because sometimes it can, you know, you, you're living under this big shadow in a way, right? Oh, for me, no, that's, that's never been an issue because, you know, one, you know, I never try and take my dad's shoes or anything like that. That's, that's one thing. So that, that's not an issue. And, and there, there are people who will, they, they make this false assumption that I, you know, I wasn't my dad's number one advisor because you gotta, you, here's the thing. There were a lot of things I did behind the scenes that were far better and greater than my dad. You know, I mean, I get higher, you know, open rates on my emails than he ever got. <laughs> right. But it's and it's not just open rates; it's a lot of stuff. And my dad gave me lots of praise. We spoke so much, and he was my number one advisor. I was his number one advisor, and we're so close in a way that a lot of people don't understand. You can't shake my faith in what my dad thought about me or what I would be doing right now. <laughs> you know, right. like your, your dad wouldn't want you doing this with that, or you know, stuff. It's it's all not. Nonsense. I know better than anybody else. So I never really, but I never really had this like, you know, living in a shadow thing because I don't, I never wanted to become a copywriter for clients and, you know, do that. I always wanted to create a business, make money. And then to me, I measure money in time, you know, based on my fixed, you know, expenses and everything like this with this much money in the bank and stuff coming in, how long before the wolf is at my door, you know, that I can just take. So I take an extraordinary amount of time to spend with my kids, to enjoy my life, go walk on the beach, you know, do stuff and things like that. And so I never tried to become Gary Halbert or, and everything like that. So it's, it, you know, living, there's, there's been no stigma or anything like that, that I'm worried about with that. Plus there's also one other aspect. Gary, having the Halbert last name gets you in the door and it opens doors. There's no doubt. I never have a problem with, you know, if I hear somebody's a great big copywriter or a great big direct marketer and everything, I, you know, I feel free, you know, calling them and saying, hi, you know, can I get a few moments of your time? My name is Bon Halbert and they'll recognize the name and let me in the door. But what keeps me in the door or being invited back is the fact that I am a Halbert. It's the fact that, you know, and you got to understand you couldn't have grown up being my dad's son without learning a lot. Even if you even if you didn't take it on naturally and even if you didn't actually uh, dive in more than the others like I did. Because my dad didn't talk about basically much else. He didn't have – his only hobby was buying cameras and boats, right? Okay. And on the boats, we talked about business. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I you know I grew up – that's what dinner talk was about. Like I said, we've been stuffing and sealing envelopes since we were kids. I, you know, all these masterpieces people talk about that my dad wrote, I remember being the first person to ever read them. And he was – you know, he had me predicting uh, – you know, direct direct response results early on, and I, I quickly became one of the better people at measuring it because I would measure my emotional feeling. You know, because he taught me how to think. So you know, and the way that you think as a marketer is really it's not about you; it's about thinking of like the other per people. It's about under you know and. You know, so you'll see people, newbies, making those mistakes in their writing, and especially business owners that don't know better. And they'll say, you know, they'll start off with, you know, I was born in Ohio, and then I got my degree, and I went to Cal State San Francisco, and so forth and so on. It's like, no, this isn't the time to say that. Nobody cares about that. Say something exciting. Get them wrapped in. And when you need to prove that you're a professional, that's when you say things like that. You know what I'm saying? And it's, the, it's everything in marketing is all about relationships and understanding what that other person is thinking. Yeah. You know, so that way when you're writing copy, you're like, now this is what he's about to think. And so let me answer that question or that qualm before he thinks it, you know, and this is going to lead him into thinking this, Oh, I'm coming to the end of the page. I really need to amp up this intrigue and curiosity to make sure he turns the page. Mm -hmm. You know, you're paying attention to everything. You're paying attention to if you're writing an ad, where does the eye naturally drift on after you formatted it? You know, if it, like I said, if it's a direct mail piece, you know, how, how are you ending this piece of paper? Here's something a lot of people don't know. My father wrote le on legal pads, you know, long, long yellow legal pads. He had different, he always had a favorite like box of pens. He never went with fancy pens, but, but the one thing that never changed, that changed like from one decade in the seventies, it would be felt tip or whatever. 
But he always had the, the legal yellow, let, excuse me, the yellow legal pad. But because, and I was like the first one to spot this and notice it. What happened was it, he it figured out that one legal pad of his handwriting equaled about one page of type. So that when he was getting to the end of the page, he knew he was getting into where where it would be typed. And so then he would amp up the curiosity before he said, go turn to page two. He wanted to leave you on this cliffhanging note, this incomplete thought that made you almost compelled to turn the page. Right. So it shows that he's not just paying attention to his words. He's paying attention to everything from how you, you know, the vessel that, re- that sends the message. You know, this message is coming through an email. Are these people email adverse or are they regular with it? This, this vessel is a direct mail, a number nine envelope. You know what I'm saying? So therefore, they're you know right now they're looking for a window and they're looking for a bulk rate stamp or anything in their human spam filter to tell them this is junk mail to throw it away. Mm-hmm. So that's one of his big breakthroughs is he you know he quickly stepped into their shoes and says this is what they're doing, you know. And so he cre- you know he became famous for getting his mail open. And I actually took the exact same principles he did. And which he called his A-pile, B-pile speech because everybody, when you got home, put your mail into one pile. The A-pile was for letters and bills and stuff you had to open. B-pile was maybe stuff and promotional and maybe something from the plumber. And, you know, after a time, eventually everything in the B-pile went into the trash because it piled up, right? (laughs) So he called it the A-pile, B-pile speech, how to get your mail into the A-pile. Well, I did the A-pile, B-pile online, how to get your emails open and read. And I basically used his speech, basic, you know, and all the concepts and explained the basic core fundamentals and how that was used. You know, so, for example, while everybody was telling him put teaser copy on the outside of the envelope, he left it with – he used curiosity. And so that's what I use. <laughs> gotcha. You know. Well, who would help with with editing? Because I, I notice when I write, uh, I'm fortunate now. I mean, I've got my wife. My kids are getting older. Sometimes I have them read it. My mom helps me uh, in my business with writing and press releases and stuff. But um, like that that first draft, you know, I just I let it just dump. And, yeah. and I notice every single time I'm moving one to, you know, one paragraph to half a page, you know, up and inserting it into the third paragraph. I mean, because it, it doesn't flow right once you step back and read it. But in the beginning, I wouldn't always step back and read. I would write it, just hit send. Yeah. Uh, you know, but at least I got it out and I made money. Um, but, you know, what, would you help with the editing? And, and how can that local business owner or that salesperson that's trying to, you know, write their own stuff to get mail, email open because their marketing department is really the sales prevention department. You know, what? how can they get a little bit of editing help before they hit send? Okay, well, this one, if I gave you everything I knew, would also take an hour and I could tell you the exact formula for it. Maybe <laughs> maybe you and I should actually let you record that and then you make a product like Lawton did right. the other one. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, well, yeah, we can because I have I do know the editing tips. First of all, um, let me give you a couple things. One, um, and you know, I like how John Carlton puts it. You know, go ahead and kill trees. Make sure you're printing. Print, print, print. I have a laser black and white printer because it's the cheapest, and I can just you know feel free to print long stuff. And do your editing from print form. Don't do it while it's on the screen. Okay, that'll help. And what I end up doing, same thing you're talking about, I circle the paragraph and, and put the arrow up to where it's supposed to be moved. <laughs> sure. Or label it A and then put the A where, where I'm going to insert it later. Yep. But then read that copy aloud. The, reading that copy aloud is what professionals do and amateurs won't. Okay. Yep. And I don't, you know, and it, at first it feels a little embarrassing, a little stupid. But if you're a professional and you've done it a few times, if the, and it's an important piece, you will not fail to read it out loud it is that critical for spotting where your copy doesn't flow where the mind stops and jars itself okay and then what you want to do is a series of hunts you want to hunt down big words that are too fancy nobody will ever fault you for using common everyday language but you know if i come in and i say you know uh my pro my propensity for prolixity places me precariously on the precipice of pop- pomposity <laughs> you're actually annoyed your mind is no longer your mind is now thinking about me and my jackass vocabulary <laughs> <laughs> and stuff like that. I totally destroyed the mood and the mode for which, you know, and that's very important to control. It's why copywriters say, you know, hi, you know, my name is Nancy Halbert. And that way, you know, that you start reading this as a, the tone of the person is a woman, yep. you know, or you tell somebody, hi, my name's Emma. I'm, you know, I'm 13 and I do this and that, you know, and you're like, okay, I'm being written to by a little girl. It sets the tone, right? 
You vocabulary everything. All that sets the tone. Nobody will blame you for using basic language. People, but you will lose people if you go above the fifth grade, right? Now, and it, do, it doesn't mean to be, you know, don't fail to take the opportunity to use technical words to show your professionalism, but immediately explain them away in a very, in a very, um, in a kind of way that anybody could understand it. Right. You know, so like, for example, you're writing a piece for Forex. You say this is, you know, where you, you know, where we make a pip by, or excuse me, like stock system. You turn around and say, you know, and this is where it'll go up a tick. By the way, a tick is one thirty second you know, of a share or sure. or a point. A point is equal to a dollar, you know. And so you're showing that you're a professional and knowing it. But you're also showing that the audience, your readers, your your buyers are going to feel safe because you're never going to leave them hanging and not knowing it. Right. Right. But basically your language, hunt down the big words. In fact, I, 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 I'm always afraid that I'm going to credit the wrong person with it. So I'm not going to credit the person but because um, the people that I credit, I'm always praising them anyway. But one of the guys I know that's very smart, he has his kids. He gives his kids like a quarter or 50 cents for every big word they find. He has them read it. Right. So that, to make sure that even his kids can easily read and understand and know all of, you know, go through it. OK, but hunt down the big words. And then my dad will teach you to hunt down the words like that, because 95 percent of the time you can improve that language by um, getting rid of uh, just eliminating the word. Sometimes you have to change it to which and don't, don't get rid of all of them. There's still some cases where that is important. You have to say it was that car over there. Um, but there, but a lot of the time that actually comes out as we're typing and flowing like the language in our head. But when you read it, it's, it, it makes it much smoother and much more professional when you remove that. And, you know, actually there, you know, like I said, we could go on for an hour. I got a bunch of these tips. You got to break up your sentences, you know, and one of the keys to doing that is most of the time when you look for the and, hunt down those ands and see if that's a good spot where honestly you could just stop and break that sentence in two, put one on a period. You know what I'm saying? Sure. But they, but basically what you want to do is is editing is a formula, okay, where you start from the beginning, you're reading aloud, you're finding the spots, you're moving, you know, and then you go, okay, this isn't the, you know, this piece is good, but it needs to be up here, and I need to say this before that. And then, you know, you go over it and smooth it again. I mean, and here's what I say about marketing or copywriting. All your real power in copywriting is in the research. It's in knowing your prospect and delivering the, the right message and the right offer. Okay? So the thing that made the Domino's pizza campaign great was not the fact that they turned around and said 30 minutes or less or it's free. It was the offer. It was the fact that they knew their market so well that their market was getting sick and tired of not being able to predictably rely on when the pizza was going to get there. Right? So they started doing 30 minutes or less for free. They could have said half hour or it's on us. They could have reworded it in any way. Right. So the power was in the research. And that's where the power is in your marketing, too. It's an understanding who your clients are, what they want and delivering them what they want. Actually, you're selling them what they want. You're delivering that. But you're also giving them what they need to do that as well. And then what um, the copy dump is the quickest phase. You know, there's some brainstorming. That's where the creativity. That's one of those areas that, you know, out of all of this stuff, that's where I like the most. And I in. You know, without trying to sound like an egotistical jerk, it's the area where I pro- shine a little bit better, which is coming up with the hook, the angle, the offer, the big idea, as my dad used to call it. That's what I spent all my time learning, the big idea that, you know, because when people say, hey, Gary, how are you going to do this? <laughs> you know, I say, do it this way. And I got so good at it that even when it was something that was outside my dad's normal recommendation, I would predict it right. Not even being in the room, <laughs> you know, right. my brother, brother one time came to me and said, how would you do this? And he said, don't tell dad. Later, I found out my dad's working on it for him. And he got, I go, hey, what'd you tell him to do? And he said the exact same thing I told him to. Right. right. So anyway, um, where was I? <laughs> no, we we're talking about editing and hunting down words and um, yeah, saying well, it out loud, printing it. So you want to, yeah, you want to continue. You want to use the oh, 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 we were talking about the professionalism. The the re, the the power in your marketing is in the research. Yep. The 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 creativity is in the hook and the angle that you develop, right? And that that's one part that can take some talent or at least modeling. Okay, you can use that trick that I just talked to you about earlier. That'll do it, actually. And it'll start giving you the skill set to do it as well. But the professionalism in copy comes in the editing. 
If you read unprofessional people's copy, it'll do exactly what you were talking about, which is just write it. And if you read their copy, the way that they re- that they edit is you'll read it and it's like, well, this is a great headline. It's transitioning. It's pretty smooth. And then it starts to fall apart. And by the end, it's like, you know, it's got grammatical errors that you're just wondering, you know, even a fifth grader would have caught. And the reason is they started editing at the top, read and fixed and read and fixed and read and fixed about three paragraphs down. And then they went back up to the top and started again. And so by the time that ad is done, they've scanned and looked at the very top 10 times. And at the bottom, they've looked at it once. Right. Okay. And which, so that's one of my things that I've never heard other people talk about, but do it in complete passes, edit in a complete pass from top to bottom. Okay. And that way, and then, um, but you know, and then provide eye relief, break up those sentences, don't use long paragraphs. And, you know, and again, there's, you know, I don't want to take up all the monopolize and just go on for hours, but there's just a whole list of those tricks and you can, you can look them up and find them, or, you know, maybe we can put together something, but basically what you, what it is, is it's like a checklist that you go through and you, you're, you're, you just do this. And as you go through the checklist and you scan and you read and you're looking for this and you're doing this all aloud, you find the stuff you find and the whole thing gets smoothed out and it starts to be very slick, but there's a lot of other copywriting talent type of tricks that will even improve that. So right. for example, after I read stuff, I will go and look at the end of sentences and, and, and measure how strongly the reader is going to now feel to have to continue reading it. And so, you know, I've actually created this um, um, I'm working on. It's one of the things I'm working on now, which you asked about, is a it's basically how to get these people to read every single word you write. OK, and, ba- and, and there's a there's a process for doing it that, uh, you know, keeps them going and they call it the greased slide. You know, it's it's where you kind of like the attraction gets in there and then you fall into it. And it's so interesting. You can't get out of it. It's like the Godfather movie. You can go into the Godfather movie at any point in any scene. It's like you get, you know, I, I mean, other people may not like it because it's a violent movie or something. But I get it. I get to look at the Godfather. If it comes on, no matter what scenes in there, I'll sit there and go, OK, I'll just watch this scene. And then I'm just like sucked in there because it's just one great scene after another after another. There's no spot that makes you feel, OK, it's, you know, I'm comfortable leaving the room now. Well, do you think that um, from being empathetic, right? Putting myself in the shoes of that local chiropractor or auto repair shop, they're going to think, no way in hell am I going to be that good. You know, I, I, I turn wrenches for a living. Uh, I can't write the godfather for my marketing. But what you said just a minute ago was that it is indeed a checklist, right? I mean, anybody can learn this if they start with an empathetic approach, put themselves in the mind of the prospect, and just ask really good questions of of their best clients, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, you're asking me about the very many details that serious professional copywriters do, but it's the least important. Mm-hmm. The most important thing is exactly what you're talking about. It's understanding your customer, finding out what they want. Getting the message to them in the least expensive way you can, where it will be delivered, that you now are offering what they want and giving them the kind of offer and deal they want. That's going to do more good than, than you know, worrying about finding a that in your copy or reading right. it through and stuff like that. So the, you know, when you get down to that level and that detail, that's, you know, that's a good tip and advice for a professional copywriter or, you know, and most of the time when small businesses are writing their stuff, they're really not writing 12, 24 page sales letters and full page ads and so forth. Um, so, um, but you can do a lot of it, excuse me, you can do a lot of it yourself. And you will do, and, and here, here's another quick trick that my dad taught everybody, which is really simple too. What you do, if you are good per, at your business and you close people who come into the shop or what, you, you know, and you sell, sell cars on the lot or whatever it is, what you want to do is start recording those, those periods of, you know, where you're selling stuff. Okay. And keep doing that until you forget the recorder is on basically until you can do it and it's not disturbing you in any way whatsoever. And then what you do is you just take the, you know, the last couple of good times you had a pitch and you closed and you made sales and you translate that and have it transcribed. 
that's actually the that right there alone is you know closer to and, and it's not but it's closer to good copy than you know a lot of times when you you know go go hire somebody who's just trying to become a copywriter <laughs> right or you know um or you know, somebody who doesn't know your business wants your money and is going to, you know, try and, you know, be very leery of a copywriter that, you know, want, you know, wants to get get it out to you in, in a week. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, they're not thinking about, it. you know, they're, they're saying what they're doing is they're buying a template from someplace and inserting your info and, you know, del- handing it to you. Right. You know, and that never looks fresh. You know, that's the one, you know, it'll work. It's better, but, you know, it, it never looks fresh. That's one of the things I like modeling hooks after news is it doesn't, you know, the example I always use is a lot of people might remember that campaign called the rich jerk. Well, if I create a campaign called the wealthy bastard, that sounds stale <laughs> and it sounds old. But, you know, if I go, you know, but it, and so it's not fresh and it won't have the same amount of play. So I think I always think it's better to go back and, you know, find, you know, if you're going to model and stuff, do it like do it in that that resources that I send you to in that video and stuff like that, because it really is much uh, uh, it's it's much more fresh and, and you know, hipper and, and more timely. And sometimes it might even, you know, sometimes you might see something and tie in something that's related to a celebrity or anything. Uh, and remember, don't, and remember, if you do go grab that thing, don't forget to re-listen to the beginning of this thing because that part about numbers and other stuff, that's not in there. I'm just teaching you where to get the hooks. Right. Gotcha. You know, so, so that's what I'm saying. I augmented that with this recording you're doing now. <laughs> well, I remember listening, um, some of the stuff your dad put out and and i'm going back to my own team and saying you know we got to go back to basics uh and but one in particular talked about using a phone number using a local number versus a toll-free number and and having people place their orders over the phone instead of online um do you have any new advice or, or research you've seen? I mean, cause that was probably, you know, eight, ten years ago. Yeah, uh, it, I, I wouldn't. Here's the thing where, I, you know, again, I differ in my dad because he had sort of some sort of absolute opinions like, you know, image mar- image advertising is never good. <laughs> type <laughs> thing. Um, so I disagree with him on that. And here's the way that I would change it. And, it, and it, again, it depends on the situation. If you're delivering your marketing online on the computer, that's where the buy button needs to be. Okay. If you're delivering your online and you're delivering that content into an, uh, a, a sales letter, you need to consider who's receiving it. The younger they are, the more often you will want to put in a. Um, a and by younger, I don't mean you know twenties. I'm saying you know if you're send, if you're sending to people who are already retired, the number is probably going to outpull a website. Right. Okay. And of course, checks are all gone. You know, that was the other thing. By the way, don't forget when my dad was saying this, we were transitioning from no checks, you know, because it, it was like, you know, credit, it, it always used to be credit card, check or telephone number or an option of all three, what was best. And so they would do some testing and sometimes find out that number only worked the best because as people delayed trying to make that decision, whether they should use the credit card or not, right. that their mind got distracted and delay is death in sales. That's how clear, that's how you think, you know, you have to think about that guy every moment. You're not, you're not just thinking about the the lady or the gentleman who has received your your thing you're thinking about the house of horrors he's in when he's reading it <laughs> yeah because i i hate calling and talking to somebody I, i'll even be on the phone with them I'm like let me i'll take your credit card i'm like can you just direct me to the link i'll type it in because it's quicker for me to type than to read this stuff off to you you just tapped onto the key of my dad's secret for the key, for the free recorded message reveals mm-hmm. the reason it's a free recorded message is to make people like you at ease that you're not going to have to talk to anybody. Mm-hmm. It's not because it's cheaper to just record the message and automate it. That was never what it was about. It was about the fact that you feel safer leaving your name on a pre-recorded message, uh, it, you know, than you do talking to somebody. Now, of course, that wouldn't do for le- you know, you're not going to call up a machine and leave your credit card number. <laughs> but the but anyway, so back to the main question. Depending on you know, in the mail, you're more likely to do a phone number order. You know, call now and order now. And that's going to be much, a much bigger imperative. Now, whether you use 800 or local, 
<clears throat> should really depend on what your market is and your positioning. So if I've got a blog and it's basically my daughter's take on some cool things to do in Los Angeles, then it needs to be not too professional, not too slick, and an 800 number would be incongruent. Okay, but if I'm a, if I'm a national company, I better have an 800 number, even if no, I don't want anybody to call it, just so I look like a professional. And people feel like there's access. Mm-hmm. You know, the reason that you know the, those little things, and this is something where I differ from my dad, as well. Those little things like the badges from the Better Business Bureau, been in business for 25 years. These are all little itty bitty telltale signs that overall make somebody feel comfortable that you're not running away with their money or pulling something. Right. You know, and so that's that's another that's a that's another reason to go with an 800 number. Now, if you're the local printer or, you know, look or, or local plumber and you just work with local businesses, that area, that local area code will give you some SEO, which is something my dad wouldn't have known about, you know, because he right. passed away. <laughs> right. But that that would give you some SEO and you'd be speaking to your target market and it would tell all those other people, yeah, you are a local plumber. Right. And then you could play up that angle of, you know, look, these houses were all built in 19, around 1948. I understand them all. I'm the local, I'm, you know, I, most of my business is focused in here. So not only have I been around and I'm really good and I'm a professional, but I really know your neighborhood and, your, and the plumbing in your house better than you ever could because I know not just the original plumbing, but I've seen how they've done the upgrades over the decades. You know, um, but anyway, so when you're when you're showing something highly local like that, then it's probably better to have your local number. So I don't always agree with my dad. It depends on the you know have the the when, what you think about it is when somebody receives your message right there where they are. What's the fastest and easiest way that they can say yes and hand you some money? Yeah, I love you know the word is congruent, right? Because I always talk about that. It's got to be the letter to the website to the checkout. What it just all has to, they have to be comfortable that they're in the right place, the same place, the safe place uh, to provide whatever. Just maybe it's just an email, maybe it's an actual credit card, but it's, it's that congruency is key, huh? Oh, my dad wrote the most widely mailed sales letter in history. I don't know if it still holds that distinction, but, I mean, it was over 600 mail, million mail the last time we even checked on it, right? right? And the whole key, one of the keys to that, because Kevin and I actually spent a lot of time breaking it down, line for line and word for word, explaining all the like, hidden psychology that even other professional copywriters never saw. Right. And the copywriting starts way before anybody ever would ever think. And I'll, I'll let you guess. Where do you think the copy? Just imagine you're being sent a, a, a one-page sales letter from my father. Where do you think the copywriting starts? Where the copywriting starts? You talking about like in the research? Or you talking about like with how? No, does, how, on, how the, on the actual. You just received the envelope. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. It starts in the envelope. I mean, how, how do you address? Like you said, do you put a teaser on there? Or do you have curiosity? It's, it starts with the address. Now, here's the thing. And a lot of people didn't understand this. You know, my dad had the the address was was left. He used curiosity. The whole idea was a blank envelope, a regular number nine or ten envelope that anybody might have, a real live stamp. You know, so this doesn't look like a bulk rate and something to tell you that it was a sales pitch, no windowed envelope, no teaser copy on the outside, and just a return address on the corner card. But it was actually the numbers and the address that was the first psychological piece of congruency. And this is how it worked. He was the whole sales pitch was based on the idea that there's this lady, and it was actually my mother. And says, "Hi, you know, I've been doing. We've been doing some research on on the on the same name you have, and I've been put generating these reports, and I have extra copies of the report. Would you like them? That's the you know the sh- really short version of it. Um, and would you like it? So the whole thing to be congruent had to sound like this was a housewife, mm-hmm. right? And so to sound like it was a housewife, it couldn't be from Sunset Boulevard." Right. So they had to, and so they went and got an office and a place to make sure that one, it had a very low digit number in the address, right? And they wanted to make sure that it was like a basic, like main Elm Street type of address, you know, something very average, everyday America. But they also spelled out the word street. And the reason they did that is because everybody who's not a house, you know, who spells out street, housewives, elderly ladies, and people who just fill in children, people who don't mail often, 
So instead of saying, you know, uh, you know, this is on, you know, Everett St. Period, it, it literally spelled out street. Okay, and the, now actually, I'm not sure if that was in the in the in the inside of the envelope and in the outside. I know it was on the inside on the sales page, but the but the 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 they actually went around, and I know that my dad went and made sure that he bought got himself an address, a legitimate physical address that would match on the congruency of the whole marketing campaign all the way through, mm-hmm. and it matches. All the way through, right. there's you don't you don't get the idea that this is being sold by you know that this is a monstrous company that it, it, I remember they took up at least an entire floor, it might be more, of a bank building just to handle all the che- uh, the checks and the bank deposits, mm-hmm. right? And I mean it was I mean they they had money sacks coming in, and it was like one of those scenes from Scarface. And, um, you know, but for when you read that letter, the coat of arms letter, by the way, is what it's called. Um, it is, I mean, you would never know that. It, it, it's congruent from the addre- the return address on the envelope all the way to the last word on the page. Yeah, and, and most people, A, they don't know to, to think to that level of detail, and, and most just won't do it. You know, but you know, and uh, don't overthink too much. I mean, you you are, you know, when you're talking about that, you're also talking about competing with a guy who is so studious and so dedicated and so, I mean, who put every waking hour into becoming the best marketer and salesman and copywriter he could possibly be and became one of the best in history. Mm -hmm. So I'm not expect, you know, I mean, I don't even put that kind of, you know, I mean, my dad, I'll give you, you know, the the thing that about my father and the thing about me is, you know, my dad could have taken his talent and done a lot more script and, you know, kind of other things writing. But the thing is, he didn't, you know, he didn't, want to put in an incredible amount of time and energy so you know the the the, he did that one because he was hungry later years he got a little bit more sloppy you know what i'm saying right and the thing is what you want to do is the one of the main main lessons that my dad taught people and i'm sure he's probably not the guy who coined the phrase but he always taught me motion over meditation yeah and he said anything worth doing is worth doing poorly (laughs) which means just try it get out the door yep and you know and you know my dad had a severe level of dedication i've i really don't see in many people i see it in my son in his artwork and i remember writing him a little letter as i was watching him draw um something that was in the museum he just has this focus that's long term like if he gets into something he'll stay with it and just want to be better at it and go for like years and my dad was that way with copywriting he read the Thomas Hall letters and decided that's it. I'm going to do copy, be a copywriter the rest of my life. Right. And you know that became his main goal. He put all of his energy and efforts into it. And you know, I mean, his whole family. You know, you were either on board with the program or you weren't in the program at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so you know, it's it, you know, in some cases it was no choice. But in my case, I actually turned around and you know. You know, he tur- You can read about how it happened and everything in that in the book, the board letters. But he turned around because I expressed an interest in it, and he said, "Okay." And he started teaching me in earnest. He would take me out of school to go to brainstorming sessions, and we flew all over the country and sometimes out of the country for business meetings and you know showing me the ropes. And he would tell me what was going on before the meeting, what we we're going to do. He would I'd be in the meeting, and then he would give we talk about how it went down. He'd say, you know, see how he did this. This is, he's not going to do that. This is he's going to go home. He's going to do this, and he's going to flay, or he's going to go and this is what he's going to do, and then he's going to discover this, and then he's going to call me. You know, and he would just he so he would he would be educated me before, during, and after these things, and eventually I just became a part, uh, participating person. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but the thing is, the dedication and the level that you need doesn't need to be that insane. Right. You know, if you're dedicated to providing your customers with what they want, not what you think they want. You know, but you're listening to what they tell you and you're and, you know, in a lot of cases you can, you know, there's sometimes you develop something they don't know they want because it doesn't exist yet, like an iPhone. Right. You know, and you can do that kind of experimentation. But what you better be, you know, you want to get feedback really quickly (laughs) and pivot because it's about finding the market and delivering what it wants. And it's not about you. And it's, you know, and it's not about uh, and you don't have to worry about 
that level because most of the time what you do is like by the time my dad got to that level of the address and stuff, this was already being 18 months into a one-page letter. That's how much time and effort he did testing and changing. Almost every single word of that one-page document has been tested. Right. And this was back when testing was expensive and was not, you know, and took a long time to get the results. Right. It wasn't like nowadays where you can throw a couple of headlines up on Craigslist and see who gives you the most clicks <laughs> or something like right. that. Right. Well, did, you know, Dan Kennedy talks about um, psycho-cybernetics, how much that really helped him. Uh, but, you know, did your dad or you, do you get into, like, uh, persuasion, NLP, uh, disc profiles, understanding people's personalities and things like that, or just have you just been marketing and copywriting experts and just kind of had a knack for empathy and, and connecting with human beings? Um, never, ever did my dad do it or get into it or study NLP or any of that. And I don't either. Um, I mean, I actually, I remember one time I did go to a, um, an event that was based on studying that. I was just checking out the event. Um, and I found it to be somewhat interesting and everything. But the thing is, is my dad and I, you know, where I, a lot of people say, sometimes I write like my dad. Okay, but they say it sometimes, and I get the best compliment of all, which is even better than what my dad got, which is people don't talk about what I write. They talk about the offer I make, which is what my dad taught me to go for, right? Um, And the... You know, the thing about it was it's the reason I sound like my father is because, you know, there's no way you don't sound like your father. You're going to pick up some of his sayings. You know, I tell my kids when they say they're hungry, I say, didn't you eat yesterday? Because my dad said that to me (laughs) Um, and all that kind of stuff, because you're going to you're going to be a lot like your father anyway. And you're going to be a lot like your mother. You, and, you know, if you if you find that your mother always raises hell to get what she wants in a store, you'll be somebody who comes in and learns to raise hell to try and get what you want. Or you or and this is the other thing, or you'll go the exact, exact polar opposite, opposite yeah. but polar opposite that you won't be you won't be just a little nicer about it. You'll just you know go the exact opposite mm-hmm. direction. But anyway, so I grew up my dad's gift for persuasion was in print was just a, a good a good writing skill applied to his gift of persuasion in person my dad could convince people to do almost anything and then what so i grew up next to him so when i grew up to him i i paid you know i learned how to persuade the way that he learned to persuade and he was a master at persuasion early on so when it comes to me i can't tell you and i'm not saying i'm 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 not even claiming to be a master at it but the thing is when it came to me i don't know whether it was knack or dna you know i don't know if it you know i can't tell you if it's nature or nurture Right. You know, it could be in my DNA because I'm my dad's kid. It could be because I was raised by him. But the thing is, what you'll see as far as a, a sound of persuasion is actually, you know, more in our personalities than it is purposely put into the writing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, and I've had people actually break down emails that I wrote, and they did, either didn't know I wrote it or, you know, because it was either a sub a sub pen name or for whatever reason. I've seen them actually break down my emails and explain how I was using NLP and all this stuff. And But the, the guy was actually very sharp and pointed out he may not know that he's doing this because I didn't. You know, he's like, right. but you, know, you see the incredible use of you and your and how he's talking about you and the providing and all this other stuff. This is all stuff we do naturally, right. you know, and, uh, and but but when I say I do it naturally, I can't, you know, I mean, I could have just been modeling my dad who figured it out and, you know, purposely did it. Right. Or maybe he was doing it naturally the way I am, too. But my dad could really persuade people. And, uh, you know, so I will get that comment. And that actually, most of the time now, it's considered a compliment. I, you know, it used to be, you're just like your father was an insult until he right. passed away. <laughs> and then, then it was like, you're just like your father was a great compliment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I don't mean by the way I took it. I meant by the way they meant it. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so when they uh, but it would be like I was on the phone with Mark Victor Hansen, and I said, "Hey, look, you know, and you got no downside, you know, if you, if I do it this way, and then if if I'm right and if I'm wrong, well." And he goes, "Man, you sound just like your dad." <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I you know when that's when I was like, you know, I love that compliment. 
I like that. I don't like you, you know, you write just like your dad. Um, but when people do it, like one time I was reading something aloud to John Carlton, he said I, that had some of my dad's stuff in it. He said, I could hardly tell how, you know, your writing is any different from your father's. Mm-hmm. And that meant a lot to me as a compliment. You know, sometimes you think somebody's just being a compliment just to be nice. You know, I'm not, right. you know, I'm leery of those too. I mean, my, I don't, I got to be careful not to let my ego get inflated because somebody's just being kind. <laughs> Right. But it was, you know, it really just comes out of the fact that I speak like him. And that just comes out of the fact that in a large way, I behave like him. Um, I do believe that if you are somebody who spent no time with people at all, studies of that stuff might might help you more. But the more time you spend with people, you know, the more t- the more you are the kind of guy who's picking up chicks in bars and convincing people to let you do stuff that you're not supposed to do. <laughs> You know, my dad actually, um, one of my favorite stories that I just heard from my mother is my mom and dad stayed in Ian Fleming's house for a whole week after he had passed away before they ever turned it into a hotel or anything. They had the whole place to themselves for a week because my dad met this lady who was or yeah, met this lady who was his secretary in a bar and finagled his way to get into and play and rent the place for an entire week and sit at the desk where he wrote James Bond stuff. And he sat up with Ian Fleming's maid maid pumping her for information about Ian Fleming all night in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, and he was the kind of he was the kind of guy who got away with that stuff. You know, like when when somebody when something was against the rules, he was the guy who was gonna be able to get the exception. Right. You know. Well, and, that, and that's key to anything. You know, it's so it's so ironic. I meet these entrepreneurs and even salespeople, but certainly entrepreneurs that, you know, they own their own business and they hate sales and marketing. Like, they're they're afraid of it. And it's like, man, you know, nothing happens until a sale is made. You know, and embrace it. You know, as, as long as what you're providing provides value and improves their lives um, and, and you're better than the competition, you know, you owe it to them to help them find you so you can yeah. improve their lives. Work on your product or your service till it's so damn good you can't help but be proud and want to brag about it. And that way, it's not salesmanship. It's just telling people about some greatness you're giving to the world. Yep. That's you know that's the thing. You got to get over that. You know, a lot of people don't want to do the you know Cal Worthington and his dog spot and pull out the tiger in the car type of thing. And I get that. You know, even though that really worked and <laughs> he made a ton of money. Right. Um, but, you know, the thing is, if you just create a product and you work on it to the point where you're like, it's the best, how long can you sit there and say, that's good, but literally, I got the best one. Just check it out. Try it. You know, don't believe me. Just, you know, give it a shot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then, you know, I mean, because, uh, you know, the, the guys who I see are the most gung ho. They are people who firmly believe in a lot of the stuff they created. They're like, you know, I, they, they, they want to convince me as badly as anybody on the planet, just as like everybody else, that this is that what they got is really great. Yep. And they're going to have no problems, you know, telling people about it because it is. You know, think about it. You think about your kids. You know, you got no problem telling everybody that your kids are in the honor roll and that they just scored all straight A's. Of course, it pisses off every other parent who doesn't have an A, you know, straight A student of a kid, but you don't care. Right. <laughs> it's self bragging and self aggrandizement, but you don't care <laughs> because everybody labels it as, you know, being a proud parent, and that's okay, right? Yep. And I do it too. I'm not, you know, I'm not knocking anybody, but the point is become a proud parent of your product. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, you know what? We've gone longer, I think, yeah. than ever on any of mine. And like I said before, sometimes I ask what your final parting words. I say we leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Become a, become a proud parent of your product. Yeah. Um, Coined want... right here for the first time. <laughs> Bam. So I never where, said. where do you want people to, to find you? Uh, Bondhalbert.com? Is that the uh, best place? That's that's where you'll find – okay, we basically – if the best info that the Halberts ever put out is still my dad's stuff. So I still like to direct people to the Gary Halbert letter. Okay. But if we augment anything and we create anything on our own, Kevin and I have a site called Halbertizing, and it's spelled with an S or a Z. There should be a redirect on that. Okay. Okay. Um, but if it's just something that's solo me and I did it all my own and you know and everything like that, it will be at BonHalbert.com. So each site will actually have completely different content. 
Gotcha. But if you, you know, if you sign up to the Gary Halbert letter, you'll still hear for all the, you know, all the best stuff from me. Um, but if it's something that is very much more like a personal natured product or, or project or something I'm working on, you know, I'm going to, I'm not, because the thing is, I'm not trying to, like I said, you know, we leave my dad's stuff to honor him. And, you know, it's not about stepping in his shoes or anything. So that's why we kind of preserve it the way it was. If that, if his site was mine, I'd revamp it and make it a lot better. <laughs> Right. You know, because this is before, you know, you could do so so much more with making things uh, user friendly. Right. Well, I, I remember when I found it, uh, the Gary Halbert letter, I, I was like, I remember like looking over my shoulder almost, you know, like, did, did I just hack into some little library, some little gold mine <laughs> and, and like the, the police are going to come arrest me? I'm like. Really, all of this is free. <laughs> you know? I because, just started reading everything. I'm like, okay, one day they're going to take this down. This is a fluke. You know, I, I got to read it all right now. It's fantastic. You know, a lot of people don't know it that you know he was the first one to really bring his marketing in the real top level, like, serious professional advice and give it away for free online. Uh -huh. And you know, the beginning of that was his newsletter, which was expensive snail mail letter. And then before that, the outline for that was actually the Boron letters, the book he, of letters he wrote to me. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you have no idea how proud I am to be, the, you know, just to see every second page say "Dear Bond." <laughs> ah, that's cool. You know, it's like wow, I'm I'm infused in the beginning of something that just turned out to be epic and changed change a small part of the world yeah. and that you know and i and again i take no credit for it i updated all the lessons in the in the in the online version or not, i mean uh the kindle version but you know it's it's just it, you know what my dad did what he put together was so great and that's why we just you know honor it and you know leave the site the exact way he want we will add to it but we'll only add to it when people are adding to the gary to in talking about gary halbert it's right. all it's all on that site it's all about him. Right. On the Halbertizing site, it's you know it's about the customers and it's about delivering content and newer stuff. And you know if it's really just much more of a personal nature thing, that's where I'll, I'll just that's where I'll use BondHalbert.com. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. All right. Well, thank you, sir. This has thank been you. fantastic, and uh, we'll have links to everything um, in the show notes. Uh, when we get this up here in a couple of weeks, this will be episode session 77. So the saleswhisper.com slash 77. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a great day. You too, Wes. How cool is that, huh? Hearing the words of wisdom from Bond, who learned it directly from his dad. And not only did he learn it, you know, he wasn't just a passive observer. He was doing it, uh, and he has done it ever since. Uh, a lot of content in there, you know, he started out talking about, you know, direct mail is hot again. I don't think direct mail really ever went cold. Uh, I think people shifted their focus on social media and things like that because it was easy and fun. But direct mail has always worked. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look uh, at that. You know, um, Bond also is inspiring in the way that, you know, he's following his passion, doing what he wants to do, uh, which is not writing for others. You know, he's doing his own thing. Uh, money is not necessarily his biggest motivator, so he's out there, you know, making things happen. But listen to uh, his advice, talking about the evolution of a copywriter. Get good at marketing. Get good at writing. Okay, like he said, it's not just sitting down and writing. The thinking is where the talent and the effort is. You know, was it Henry Ford or I don't know a bunch of guys, a bunch of presidents? Uh, you know, said thinking is the hardest thing anybody can do. That's why so few people do it. Uh, and that is our little secret when it comes to writing. You know, I ask a lot of questions. I ponder things for a long time. If you read the Boron letters, um, his father Gary talks about it. Jot some things down, then walk away from that uh, project for a day, two days, three days, and let things kind of percolate. You know, and people want to complain. And it's like, you know, look, when I'm, when I'm letting it sit, it is part of the work. Believe it or not, we're not just being lazy. Uh, we are letting things percolate. So you need to do the same thing. Can you write great stuff fast? Yeah, you can. Uh, it takes a lot of practice, um, but you'll write your best stuff after writing quickly and then letting it sit and then coming back to it. Okay. Uh, he talked about 
um, really editing, not being afraid to edit, um, take out the big words, take out the boring words like very. Um, I love his idea of having his kids read it and it gives them a quarter, you know, every time they found a big word. Uh, so there's a lot of meat in here. And the fact that it's free is almost a crying shame. Uh, but, hey, we are givers. Uh, the biggest crying shame is if you don't listen to this again and if you don't take notes and if you don't implement. Okay, because I'm happy to charge you for this if you would like. Don't make me do that. Uh, but if you would like some sales help, if you're not big into writing or if you can multitask, uh, go through multiple things simultaneously, check out 30daysalesgrowth.com. Enter the uh, promo code podcast and get $30 off. Other than that, have a great day. Be sure to share this, leave a good comment, five-star rating on iTunes, and as always, sell different. <laughs>